Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the last session of the Dry Lab Impulse webinar series. And today we have uh, Haoshin from uh, Team CRI Paris and uh, uh, from Team Paris Betancourt 2018. Um, and he uh, worked in designing a software for an uh, artificial intelligence based software for designing of uh, AMP peptides, um, antimicrobial peptides. So uh, yeah, up to you, Haoshin. Okay, so thank you for the invitation and uh, uh, also I'm very glad to have this opportunity to share with iGEM community about what we did before because uh, we all know there are so many teams and so many wiki to read every year. <laughs> uh, so I'm, uh, I'm Hao Tian and today I will give you a brief introduction about AI based uh, designing of antimicrobial peptides that we did in 2018 with the team IGM Paris Pentacles. So uh, in the beginning, I'd like to give a brief introduction by myself. Uh, so I had a quite long history uh, with IGM already. Uh, in 2011, uh, I joined the undergrad team in Fudan University in China, uh, and I was a member and team leader for two years, uh, got some uh, nice experience at the time. Then I did uh, my PhD in Paris, uh, a center for research and interdisciplinary uh, called CRI for short. Uh, if you gonna join the IGEM, Jamboree next year is gonna be host uh, in Paris by CRI and, and HQ as well. So you probably will learn more about it. Uh, during the time I was the instructor of Paris Dental Code team uh, in 2017 and 18, and uh, I was serving as the judge as well. Uh, also, because I'm from China uh, originally, so uh, I'm also the board member of China Conference of IGM Community uh, in uh, the last three years when I'm doing a, a startup company. So if you are in China or if you speak Chinese and you want to move in China, uh, was an IGMer and want to do more fun uh, synthetic biology research, uh, feel free to contact me. Cool. So about this team, uh, Paris Bento Code in 2018, the project is called Star Course. Uh, it focused on the protein scaffolds for star-shaped antimicrobial peptides. It won a gold medal uh, at a year and was nominee for uh, best new composite part and the best softwares. And it was featured by Symbio Beta, the, the large community of synthetic biology, both in academia and in the industry at that year. So uh, what is uh, antimicrobial peptide and why we are uh, interested in this issue? So in the beginning, I'd like to introduce you about the, the problem of antimicrobial resistance, if you are not aware of this before. So uh, but probably you have learned from news or papers that about the, the concept of superbugs, or uh, in a more scientific way, it's called multidrug resistant pathogens. Uh, it is a huge issue because today uh, our antibiotic res research is going very slow, but the resistant genes, they are spreading super fast. And those uh, super bugs are very hard to treat with the, the drugs we already have, and it causes a much higher death rate compared to those drug sensitive uh, microbials. Uh, and it was expected by 2015, uh, 50, it's going to cost 10 million deaths per year and uh, roughly the same uh, cost in both uh, human life and uh, economy as similar as uh, cancer by that year. But at the same time, the current antibiotic market is sort of broken. Uh, why is it? Uh, it's because the discovery of new antibiotics is uh, slow and not profitable. So on the left, it was shown by economists that did this research in 2015 uh, that you could see to get a new antibiotic to the market, you need about 12 years to get this drug uh, in research. And then you have a patent, you start to sell it. Just before the patent got expired, you could just reach the balance. So therefore, no, no uh, pharmaceutical company want to do this. Uh, it's basically wasting their money. And uh, bottleneck is the discovery of new uh, identif identified leads. Uh, since 1980s, we stopped 
to discover uh, new antibiotics, especially the, 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 uh, the broad spectrum. Uh, we're still finding the gram-positive targeting antibiotics, but not for all of them. And most of the pathogens actually are negative. Uh, so we don't have a drug, a new class of drug anymore. So what is antimicrobial peptide? Actually, it has been discovered for many years. Uh, and it was considered as a very promising alternative for the commonly used antibiotics today. Here, okay, cool, it's, uh, it's moving. So this uh, video from YouTube called Antimicrobial Peptide, you could simply uh, find it uh, on YouTube to, to show how it works. So basically there are small short proteins or peptides, uh, 20 to 50 nucleic uh, amino acids. Okay, and now we can move a little bit back. So they will target into the bacterial membrane to get a pore, and then they will kill bacteria in this way. Uh, it sounds very cool, so very promising. And uh, the good part of it is very diverse, highly diverse and programmable. Uh, today, there have been 3,000 natural AMPs discovered in nature. But uh, if you look at the FDA data, uh, so there are only seven of them are approved because many of them are not suitable as drugs. Uh, they have narrow spectrum, only kill a small set of bacteria, and they are instable. Uh, as peptide, they cannot be stored in room temperature, and they are super toxic for animal cells, human cells especially. Also, at last, uh, they are extremely expensive to produce. Till today, many research and industry, they still produce AMP using chemical synthesis. It's not a green method, and also, the cost of antimicrobial peptide are as high as, as a cancer drug, and no one could afford it. Okay. So our idea uh, for this, uh, the whole team is to use protein to scaffold AMP. So basically we have a, a scaffolding monomer and we link this to fuse with AMP to make a fusion protein. And this uh, fusion protein could assemble together into a into a sort of a nanobot, uh, a star-shaped uh, complex. It's much st stabler than a single monomer peptide. And also we found it's highly efficient uh, as well as other sort of bonus uh, advantages. If you want to learn more about it, I highly recommend you to go through the wiki, uh, wiki of uh, Benacode 2018. But this also raises a problem that uh, peptide synthesis is different from fusion synthesis, right? If you fuse the AMP into another protein, it completely changes the uh, chemical physical property of this peptide. Uh, so we need to find a better sequence to adapt this design. Also, once we fuse AMP with a certain uh, scaffolding monomer protein, it also vary a lot their expression inside the bacteria. Therefore, we need sort of a design principle or software or protocol to determine which kind of peptide sequence is the optimal for a fusion design. This uh, brings up the, the idea of AMP designer that we wanted to use artificial intelligence to optimize and design a fusion AMP proteins. So for actually for many, uh, AI-based algorithm, you could find a very similar uh, common architecture. Basically, they have two parts. The first part is called the evaluation model. Uh, in this case, what we call uh, is uh, AMP forest. Uh, we will talk about this later. So basically, it will score the antimicrobial activity of a peptide uh, synthesized per cell. So it's sort of a normalized per cell. Therefore, if one peptide uh, per, per molar is not very strong enough, but it's very, si uh, very simple to synthesize by itself, it's also a good peptide because we care about the cost, not the if efficacy per molar. Uh, if a peptide is super strong, it could also be a good peptide. So basically, we give a sequence to the model, and the model will give, um, give us a score as a relative measurement of antimicrobial peptide activity. Then once we have an evaluation model, we could design a decision model or a decision algorithm or optimization algorithm. 
uh, here we call it uh, MP evolver because it's designed according to a genetic algorithm. It's very similar to directly evolution in experiment, but this one is in silico. It helps us to improve peptide sequence for higher activity. Therefore, once we have a sequence, we could uh, score it by evaluation model. And then decision algorithm will tell us, okay, based on this score, what we're gonna do to improve the activity or we just stop, it's good enough. We could just uh, make a publication or put it into the, the fermentator, just sell it. So this is the basic idea of the architecture uh, of AMP designer. Now let's go into the details of how it works. To build a model, especially machine learning or today there are more fancy uh, deep learning model, we need data to train this model. So here uh, we acquire, luckily acquire a data set uh, from uh, Tucker's uh, and the colleagues published in 2018, about the same year we uh, participate I uh, in Cell. And they have some very nice uh, uh, similarity with what we want to design. So in this paper, they design peptide libraries and then they fuse peptides with membrane proteins. Therefore, the peptides could be displayed on the cell uh, surface. If the cells are bacteria, then we will have MP displayed on the surface of bacteria and now Remember that AMP kill bacteria by targeting the membrane. Now they are already on the membrane. They are very easy to get into the membrane to kill bacteria. Therefore, better peptide you produce, uh, easier uh, you just suicide yourself uh, in the media. In this case, we could do the self-targeting assay in a very large, uh, massive parallel way. And then using NGS next generation sequencing, we could read out what kind of peptide is more efficient. If they are more efficient, bacteria tend to suicide better and there are fewer bacteria left in the media, uh, their readouts will be lower. Okay. And this cell paper uh, uh, produced about uh, 800,000 peptide sequence with high quality that could be used for later uh, model construction. And uh, this model called AMP forest uh, because it's based on random forest model. Uh, random forest is sort of a classic machine learning uh, algorithm or uh, methodology that has been used uh, 20 to 30 years already. Uh, people could also try to use uh, neural, net neural network, uh, CNN, RNN, or even ResNet, this kind of fancy network. But in our case, we tried all of them and only the random forest model give us a good result. So it's sort of a good example of the no free lunch theorem that uh, if you want to solve a problem, there are many models, many methods you could use, but you need to try all of them because there are no uh, single model that could tackle any problems. So in this case, there are some techniques we used if you want to go into details about the algorithm. So we assume that strong AMPs, they are alike to each other. Uh, therefore, if one peptide are more similar to a set of very strong AMP, they are also more likely to be a strong AMP. Therefore, we do not use sequence as a, a, a regional input to predict the, mode, uh, predict the function. Instead, we use uh, the distance, the peptide sequence compared to uh, the 100 strong peptides we already know as good MPs. So if the distance is large, uh, we expect to have a weak MP. And we compare the given MP sequence, not an MP, a peptide sequence with 100 top hits, then we could have a vector of 100 variables. These 100 variables will put into a decision tree to tell us, okay, this is a good one. This trace said this is a good one. That trace said this is a good one. And many trace said it's a good one, then we believe, okay, it's a good one. That's why it's called random forest. Forest means many decision trees. 
Uh, and in this case, it's a regression model. So each tree actually will give us a score and all the scores will like a weighted average to give the final estimation. Uh, on the right, you could see uh, the data we, we uh, try to predict. Uh, here are 47,000 peptides acquired from the same uh, data set, but was not used in the training. And we could see the model could pretty well uh, predict the uh, sequence from, uh, from the given sequence to the function at the end. Uh, here I show on both sides the measured uh, survival score and predicted survival score. A higher survival score means it is a uh, weak uh, AMP. Stronger uh, AMP has a sort of a negative uh, survival score. Okay. Now we have a scoring machine called the MP Forest. The next step is to use this evaluation model to build a decision model that we could improve to evolve the peptide from not very functional uh, peptide to a super killer peptide. So this model called the MP Evolver is in silico sort of directive uh, evolution of peptide sequence. Showing on the left is how it works as a diagram. Uh, it's, if you have done any experiment in directed evolution, or if you have tried a genetic algorithm, you will see uh, it's quite similar. Uh, all the methodology are based on the same principle that all we learn from natural evolution. That we give a input sequence as a seed or a parent sequence, you describe the MVK. And then there's going to be a strategy to generate more uh, sequences. One thing to do is random mutagenesis is the technique people usually use in directed evolution in experiments. Uh, there are other methods uh, like recombination. It's uh, also a common technique that we could see in natural uh, evolution. But here, because everything is in the computer, therefore we could try many, many different mutation uh, strategies. Uh, particularly, we know from the previous literature that the charts, the positive charts, negative charts, all of these uh, determine the efficacy of MP a lot. Even though there are not very clear rules about it, but we know uh, charge is an important factor. Therefore, in all the mutators we designed, uh, we consider this as sort of strategy. If you look into the details, uh, in the wiki we describe a, a method called a positive cluster modification. We only mutate around the amino acid that has a positive, uh, positive charge. Then we already have a long list of mutant sequence. These sequences will uh, evaluate it by our forest model. Uh, and they will give a score uh, one by one. Then we only keep the top hits. Uh, this is sort of the, um, there's a threshold that you could define by yourself. Uh, either you want the 10% or the top 10, it depends on yourself. And then these survivors will go through another generation to do the mutations, do the score, and then we got a selection for the top hits again. Okay. On the right, uh, showed uh, a comparison between random mutagenesis that uh, is very similar with experiment we usually do. Iron prone PCR generates random muta mutations that could promote directed evolution in the wet lab. And you will see actually after four generations, all the sequences converge to uh, a single uh, optimal, local optimal sequence. Uh, no matter how we repeat the experiment, it cannot jump out of that, uh, that well. And this lo uh, local optimal actually is not very optimal. Uh, you see the improvement is only uh, fourfold about. But on the right, we uh, use this sort of ration, semi-rational uh, design uh, called the positive cluster. And then we use this strategy. We could uh, improve the efficacy of AMP in, uh, for about tenfold in only three to four generations. 
three to four cycles of this evolution. And at the end, we will reach multiple different uh, sequences. Therefore, we are not uh, fitting into the uh, local optimal. There's a chance, there's an open window for us to find actually the global optimal of the peptide sequence. This is good for us because uh, for resistance, for combating resistance, you want to have different drugs. You don't want to have exactly the same drug uh, for 10 years, right? Okay, all above uh, are the, the designing of the algorithm. If the algorithm is good or not, you cannot just evaluate by computer. At the end, it still needs to be judged through experiments. So here we did a quick evaluation of MP designer. Using MP designer, we started from four peptides, uh, V6, uh, v V6 peptide, uh, Vesperin, uh, Bactofacin, uh, Arenicin, four MPs that uh, discovered from nature. Oh, V6 is uh, synthetic, I think. Um, four AMPs as starter, and then we use this AMP designer to design more peptides. We generated 12,000 peptides, we synthesized these from a twist bioscience, uh, and then we measure them one by one in wet lab. And on the left, you will see uh, after this uh, overnight culture, actually we have a small fraction of them are super uh, killing that uh, bacteria cannot grow at all, no matter how much bacteria we add in the beginning. And on the right, we show all those top heats, top candidates, what are their sequence. And it's quite surprising that the bacteria showed two strategies. One strategy is to increase the charge of antimicrobial peptide. Therefore, those peptides get super, super intense. And at the same time, it's not very good for expression, of course. The other strategy is to actually decrease the peptide charge. And then the peptides are super easy to be expressed. And this, at the same time, they still maintain some antimicrobial activity. Therefore, we have these two classes of uh, final solution. If you want to produce them in the industry to uh, sell it one day, there are different uh, mechanisms to do this. Both are good for the cost and benefit. And this cannot be really achieved in direct evolution because if you look at it in detail, uh, all these solutions has, have multiple uh, mutations. And in random mutagenesis, usually we could get only two or three uh, mutations. And it's very hard to get so many different uh, mutations at the end by experiments. So at the end, uh, I'd like to give some in instruction or advices for you. If you want to build an AI-based algorithm for synthetic biology in the future, there are some languages and the toolkits you need to think about. Uh, well, of course, first you need to have a data set, either from literature or you measure by yourself. Uh, 10,000 is a good start, starter, and sometimes we need more sequences uh, or more samples to be tested to, uh, there are uh, some papers today already reached to 100 million. But it really depends on the question you want to solve. Uh, and what is the uh, complexity of sequence space. Okay, back to this language and toolkits. Of, if you are doing iGEM, we have a sponsor from MATLAB for iGEM, so everybody could use uh, free MATLAB softwares, and they also provide a machine learning toolkits. So on the right, you could see, uh, so this I got a snapshot uh, from MATLAB, uh, their web page. So they have a large sector for artificial intelligence. You could do this with MATLAB. It's quite easy to learn and very easy to use. But in the future, if you uh, left IGEM teams like me, uh, Python is uh, probably the best solution for this right now. It's one of the most commonly used language in coding, and especially in machine learning and data science. For 
classic machine learning, like the random forest we talked about today, and others, uh, for example, SVM, there is a toolkit called uh, Scientist Learn that uh, contain most of the algorithms that you could uh, tuning and tinkering. If you are doing uh, deep learning, there are uh, three top popular uh, packages, one TensorFlow, then PyTorch and Keras. If you are, uh, you have a background in biology, I highly recommend you to use Keras. If you look at the literature, most of the biology paper, they use Keras because it's the, the easiest one that you could use. Uh, but if you are already a guru in uh, computer science, uh, TensorFlow is uh, probably the best uh, choice for this because you could uh, change out uh, everything in the dark box, in the black box. Okay, uh, that's it. That's all. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I also like to thank for the sponsors of the team in 2018. And here, starting from now, I'd like to take any questions from the audience, if there are any. Okay. Uh, thank you, Haoshi, for this wonderful talk. Um, uh, attendees, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A box. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, so are there any specific regions in the peptide that you target for mutations or you just go random? Oh, so that is, okay, good question. So we have a more detailed uh, description on Wiki, but I could give you a brief introduction here. So the method we, we use here called, uh, 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 okay, protein cluster, cluster modification. So we find a positive charged amino acid in peptide. And then we increase the chance to mutate amino acid around it. So basically uh, we still mutate peptides randomly, but the frequency are differently distributed on the peptide. This gives us a better solution at the end. Okay. And, uh, in the same slide, when you men uh, mentioned random mutagenesis, um, yeah. is it um, uh, mutagenesis to a specific amino acid? Let's say a charge amino acid or something, or oh. how is it? Okay, here the random mutagenesis is, uh, is a simulation of iron prone PCR. So you could mutate any, any amino acid and in a even frequency, even probability. Yes. Uh, okay, and um, uh, uh, in the AMP designer, you mentioned that um, you try increasing, uh, increasing or decreasing the charge of the peptide. So uh, won't that yeah. change the structure because it does change the binding and the interaction between amino acids. So won't that uh, affect the structure of the peptide eventually? Yeah, actually, uh, so uh, okay. if I could the mouse here, no, probably not. Uh, so if we, if you look at uh, the graph on the right, uh, you, you can see it's quite dense. Uh, many peptides have multiple mutations. Uh, if I remember correctly, but I cannot find it right now. The one of them has even seven uh, mutations and the total length is only 20 amino acids. So basically one third of the peptide is completely changed. Therefore, uh, the peptide structure will be largely different. Of course, uh, we can now even, it's even hardly to say it's the same peptide anymore. But how is the, what kind of structure will be for the new peptide? We don't know. Uh, it depends on uh, so structure analysis. Effect on, right. So uh, does changing the structure uh, with this also have an effect on um, the mechanism of the interaction of the peptide? Because uh, though it may uh, yes. probably have a better efficiency, but the mechanism in which the peptide interacts would be different then, right? Yes, of course. Uh, so here, what we want to, the problem we want to solve, uh, uh, we only look at the results, if a kill bacteria are good or not. And then for the future, if this is really a good candidate as a drug, uh, large companies still need to do a lot of research on how exactly a kill bacteria 
Okay. And all these mutations actually could probably bring different mechanisms into, uh, into the MPs. But here we don't know, yeah. <laughs> I have a, a question that's super related to, to this discussion. I mean, it's very interesting. So mm -hmm. I think that this mechanism relies on the fact that the peptide can insert in the membrane and pass through it, right? And then disrupt it. To yeah. Well. So you should, or the, the system should keep at some level hydrophobic amino acids to ensure that the, the overall structure has the right conditions to interact with the hydrophobic carb, the lipid bilayer. Do you yeah, yeah, yeah. impart yeah. that uh, decision when like doing the screening in the in the AI platform? Uh, I mean like does the AI platform like decide to only mutate and switch with that condition or does it does it randomly and then of course if it loses that uh, hydrophobic net uh, force that pulls it towards the membrane, it will just not kill anything and then you would just discard it as, as a failed result, for example. Oh, good point, good point. Uh, so here we have three different directions of mutations. The positive charge, negative charge, there are only four amino acids that you could choose. But for the neutral ones, actually we chose the hydrophobic amino acids that has a similar size as the original amino acid. Uh, is this gonna be a better strategy than we expand our uh, chosen set? Uh, we don't know because we only run this one experiment, but it seems that it indeed uh, include more uh, candidates. So the, the group, the green, yeah, the green one actually is the neutral charge changes. And for all four uh, seed, seed peptides, all of them has the solution that you could just remove some charges, increase the hydrophobic amino acids, then it's still working. Okay. So do you see a trend between like more successful peptides and charge. So for example, maybe positive charges are slightly more successful or the other way around. Well, so mm, it, it's hard to say because it's very, all the outcomes are very diverse. Uh, they're not like to each other. Uh, there are a few common amino acids that's been changed in different mut uh, mutants, uh, but we don't know if it's because of the algorithm or uh, yeah. So yeah, it, it's hard to say, but uh, there there is one common feature that we could say is all the changes they are extreme. So in our library, we also have many mutants. They only have one or two amino acid changed, but none of them are actually the top case. Uh, all the top case has had as like, at least three amino acid changed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but I guess it ultimately depends on what's the net charge of the peptide, because if they like. Yeah, to, they are neutral in the end, and probably that helps or not. I mean, I don't know, like, what's the charge like on the membrane surface of bacteria, so that might also play a role as to where they can come close or not. To yeah, pi well, peptide charges there are is uh, is an important feature. Hydrophob hydrophobic amino acid numbers are also another. Well, uh, the the problem for uh, the AMP is that till today we have many hypotheses for different peptides, but we don't really have a unified theory about how the mechanism works. Therefore, we cannot really rationally design the AMP. That's, that's why we have to use this sort of machine learning guided method to do this. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes perfect sense. It's not yeah. true, but it would be very cool if, if algorithms well, yeah. Like this could elucidate a bit more. Um, yeah, at the, at the end, we, we, we finally still hope to learn from the black box and open the box. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Uh, very cool stuff. Uh, I don't know if anyone has other questions. I, I don't want to like hijack the conversation a lot. I, I don't think there are questions uh, in the Q&A box so far. So if there okay. are any questions mailed to us, we'll forward them to you. Okay, cool. That's nice. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Aushin, so much for the webinar. I think it will be great for IG teams on similar projects this year.
to uh, design similar softwares using, uh, and they'll understand the logic in designing similar softwares. So thank you so much for the wonderful talk. And yeah, thank you, Esra. Yeah, so take care. I'll see you later, probably from my jam, Jamboree. Bye-bye. <laughs> I, I just wanna take Raja, a- Raja, would you like to- Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, this is the, the last webinar talk on our webinar okay. series. So I'll just want to take a brief moment to wrap up. Uh, I hope people, uh, of course, in the iDream community and hopefully outside of the iDream community that are still interested in this, found this useful. Uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of iGym teams did. Uh, and I just want to thank you for attending and keeping, uh, keeping up with us, changing times and changing days. Uh, I know it's not easy to cope, particularly during these times where everything is online. But um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you all and stay in touch. If you have any other cool ideas that the Academia and Research Committee might uh, take on, I'll be very happy to hear them. And thank you very much.